When we think of the word war, one imagines a long drawn out conflict full of heroic campaigns that can go on lasting for years, such as the two world wars, the Napoleonic Wars, or even the Mexican-American War. But this video is going to be about the shortest war in history, which was fought on the 27th of August, 1896, between the British Empire and the Sultanate of Zanzibar, and lasted for a grand total of 38 minutes. As you might imagine, the war was very one-sided, with the might of the British Empire facing off the small island of Zanzibar. The war came during the backdrop of the scramble for Africa, a particularly intense period of conflicting European colonial claims to African territory between the 1880s and the start of the First World War, with the short conflict now being known as the Anglo-Zanzibar War. So why exactly did this war start? What happened between Zanzibar and the United Kingdom to cause them to go to war? And why was the war so short? Well, make sure to stick around because this short seven minute documentary will cover all and more. And if you like this video, please subscribe and let me know in the comments if there are any other topics you would like to see me cover. Zanzibar is located in a small island chain off the coast of Tanzania in the Indian Ocean and used to be a Portuguese colony until the island came under the control of the Sultanate of Oman in 1698 who expelled the Portuguese. Up until around 1890 the Sultans of Zanzibar had controlled a significant portion of the Swahili coast around modern day Tanzania. This is where the British Empire came in. During the scramble for Africa in the 1880s the British and German empires both planned to take control of parts of the Zanzibar Sultanate for themselves and over the next next few years nearly all of the Swahili coast that was controlled by the sultans of Zanzibar was lost to European colonial powers. By this time the then sultan Majid bin Said held his power in the East African slave trade becoming one of the island's main exports seeing as many as 50,000 slaves passing through its ports which comes back into play later. With modern day Tanzania and Zanzibar falling into the sphere of the British Empire's influence, the island gradually fell into their control. Before the relationship was formalised in the 1890 Heligoland Zanzibar Treaty between the British and German empires, the treaty made Zanzibar into a British protectorate with the Sultanate still largely in control of the island. It may sound like a bad deal for the Sultanate and the people of Zanzibar with how we know how the British Empire operated, but really it was in their interest as it stopped German interest in the area and British rule through the Sultanate barely changed. Where the friction began was with a new successor to the Sultanate, Hamad bin Fuwani, in 1893. While he was considered to be pro-British, there was general's dissent among his subjects to the increasing British control, the British army troops that was present on the island, and the abolition of slavery, which was the most valuable trade for the island. In order to control the dissent, the British authorised that the Sultan could raise his own guard unit to protect the Sultan and the palace. The palace itself was established by the Sultanate as the seat of the government in Zanzibar town and is believed to be the first building in East Africa to have electricity and the complex itself wasn't built with defence in mind as it was mainly built with timber. On the 25th of August 1896 Sultan Hamad died suddenly. Hamoud bin Mohammed was lined up as a potential successor by the British as he was more favourable to British rule. However, the late Sultan's nephew, Khalid bin Bargash, moved into the palace of Zanzibar on the same day without seeking British approval and declared himself the new Sultan. Despite being warred against it by British diplomats, Khalid ignored the warnings and mustered a civilian force of 2,800 armed men to join his palace guards and amassed an artillery with assistance from the German Empire. The self-proclaimed Sultan took control of the Zanzibar Navy, which consisted of a wooden ship and the HHS Glasgow. At the same time, the British consul to the island moved to amass their own force to protect the consulate, employing 900 Zanzibari Ascaris and commanding any sailors to come ashore and join the forces. The British consulate called all British citizens to retreat to the consulate for protection in case negotiations with the self-proclaimed Sultan failed. The British diplomat Basil Cave continued to implore Khalid to stand down and leave the palace, but these were ignored as 30 minutes after the late Sultan was buried, Khalid proclaimed himself successor to the people of Zanzibar with a royal salute. The British consulate left their flags at half mass as a show of respect for the late former Sultan and continued to try and convince Khalid to stand down knowing they could not open hostilities without government approval. A telegraph message was sent to the Foreign Office asking for authorisation to fire on the palace if no peaceful solution could be found. The next day on the 26th of August, two British cruisers, the HMS Raccoon and the HMS St George, steamed into the Zanzibar Town Harbour and took anchor. At the same time, the Foreign Office sent a telegraph back permitting the consulate to take any measures they deem fit, as long as they were certain they can accomplish it successfully. Basil Cave sent a final communication to Khalid in the form of an ultimatum, requiring him to remove his flag and leave the palace by 9am the next day, or he would open fire. During that afternoon, all merchant ships were cleared from the harbour, and British women and children were taken aboard the HMS St George for their safety. 
The consul that night reported that the silence that hung over Zanzibar was appalling. Usually drums were beating, but that night there was absolutely no sound. The next day on the 27th of August at 8am, Khalid sent a message to the consulate requesting parlay from Cave, which was refused, with a statement saying they would only agree to speak if Khalid agreed to the terms of the ultimatum. At 8.30am, Khalid sent a second message saying he had no intention of taking down his flag and that he did not believe that the British would open fire. At 8.55am, after having received no further word from the palace, aboard the St George Rear Admiral, Harry Rawson hoisted the signal to prepare for action. At exactly 9am, the British General Lloyd Matthews ordered the British ships to begin their bombardment. At 2 minutes past 9, Her Majesty's ships, the Raccoon, Thrush and Sparrow, opened fire on the palace at the same time. Over 3,000 defenders, servants and slaves were present at the time in the mainly wooden palace, causing many casualties in the bombardment. During the bombardment at 5 minutes past 9, the captured Glasgow ship opened fire on the HMS St George, but was immediately sunk in the return fire. With it being sunk in shallow harbour, the masts were still visible. The crew of the Glasgow raised the British flag as a token of surrender and were rescued. During the bombardment, Khalid fled the palace, reportedly as the first shell landed, and took refuge in the German consulate. The shelling from the British forces continued until 9.40, by which time the palace had caught fire, the Sultan's artillery was obliterated, and his flag was cut down. Approximately 500 Zanzibari men and women were killed or wounded in the bombardment, with British casualties amounting to one petty officer wounded aboard the Thrush, who then later recovered. The British swiftly restored order, put out the fires and employed Hamoud as the new sultan. Despite extradition requests and the British troops being posted outside the German consulate, Khalid remained out of British hands until he was finally captured by British forces in the East Africa campaign of World War I, where he was then placed in exile. With the war lasting less than three quarters of an hour, it's considered the shortest war in history by some stretch, with the second shortest lasting six days. While there is some discrepancy over how long it actually lasted, with some reports saying it started at 9 on the dot, or 2 minutes past 9, and even the time of the war ending is disputed, with British logs recording the ceasefire at 9.35. However, it is generally accepted that the war lasted 38 minutes, making it, by far, the shortest war in history. If you enjoyed my video, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel where I'll be making more content like this. I really appreciate you watching and look forward to seeing you again next time.